All right. Good morning. So, if you haven't figured it out by yet, early 20th century world history has not been a very happy place. You have this terrible, terrible war that has been fought for absolutely no good reason whatsoever. You have these terrible outcomes from the war where the countries that lose think they've been treated incredibly and fairly, especially Germany and Russia. Um, you have the countries that win, who've kind of won for themselves an empty victory, you know, what they got out of the war versus the cost of fighting the war was just not worth it. You've got lots of tensions between people and nations after World War II. And one of the things that we need to look at is another one of the outcomes of World War II, which was the collapse of two major land-based empires. These collapses of the, the collapse of these empires are also an outcome of World War II. Now, the guide very specifically tells us you need to know internal causes of Russian and Ottoman collapse and external causes of the collapse of these two empires. And we're going to go through both of these today. So we're going to start with the Ottoman Empire. Uh, lots of internal causes of collapse that we've talked about. We talked about before World War I, there was a reform movement amongst the Ottomans to try to modernize their economy. This is going to lead to them borrowing lots of money from the British and the French in a failed attempt to modernize their economy in an, in an attempt for state-backed industrialization that just does not work. The money they borrow and spend on these projects, it never produces the amount of resources they thought it was going to do. They couldn't pay back their debts. What ends up happening is the British and the French basically end up controlling the, the Ottoman economy in a process that we've talked about known as in economic imperialism. We've looked at economic imperialism and the control what happens. So in name, the Ottomans are still independent, but in actuality, much of their economy are controlled by these foreign powers. So all of these failed reforms are going to cause all sorts of internal issues. And then nationalism. All throughout the end of the 19th century and the start of the 20th century, the Ottoman Empire is falling apart. Nation, nationalist groups have launched successful revolutions against the Ottomans. Mostly, they're, and this is important to our story today, mostly territories they controlled in Europe, mostly white Christian portion of their empire are the ones that are breaking away. So Christians who had lived in peace and prosperity in the Ottoman Empire are now for 500 years for the most part, are now breaking away from the Ottoman Empire. And this is causing a fatal weakening of the Ottoman Empire. So this empire is in real trouble before World War I. Failed industrialization, ancient economic system that's not working. They fall victim to economic imperialism. The reforms that they attempt in their government fail. And then these nationalist revolts are causing the empire to just spiral out of control. One thing I hadn't told you, and I'll go ahead and get to this, is Egypt had been part of the Ottoman Empire. They had broken away, and after they break away, the British take Egypt over, and Egypt had always been super valuable, important territory of the Ottomans because we've said from the very beginning, Egypt is such an important um, agricultural reason, and it becomes even more important late in period three when the Suez Canal is dug and it connects the Mediterranean to the Indian Ocean through the Red Sea. So they're being picked apart. The British are picking the parts of the empire. They want away from them. Economic imperialism is happening. Nation states are having successful revolutions. It's not, this empire is falling apart. There's also groups of people that they've conquered that are not Christian, that are Muslim. 
Arab Muslims who are tired of being ruled by Ottoman Turks. So even though they both practice the same religion, they have very, very different um, ethnicities and Arab nationalists all throughout the Middle East are going to want to win their independence. And if you remember when we talked about this a couple of days ago, Arab nationalists are going to side with the British in World War One against the Ottomans. So these are people they had controlled are going to fight against them. Now, those Arab nationalists we talked about are going to get kind of screwed over because they thought they were going to get their independence and they become mandates. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Not external colonies. The biggest one was World War One. Really, truly, at the start of World War One, there was kind of a bidding war. Both the Germans and the Allies wanted the Ottomans to join the war and join their side. And very honestly, it was there's just no reason for the Ottomans to join this horrible, horrible, awful war. But the Germans made them some promises that they found to be just too good to say no to. They'd get territory back they lost. Their debts would be forgiven. And the Ottomans thought that war, which no one thought would last as long as it did and be as terrible as it did, would somehow be worth it. And obviously it's not. And since they sided with the, with the Germans, we ultimately know the Ottomans are going to lose this war. And when they lose the war, they're going to have lots of territories taken over from them in the Middle East territories that the British and the French take over as mandates, places like Iraq and Syria and Lebanon and Palestine, and the empire is going to collapse after the war. There's not going to be an Ottoman Empire anymore after World War I. So this empire that had been around, and different historians will give you different dates, at least 450 years by this point, has now fallen apart. Now, during the war, we have to talk about a truly terrible thing that happens that involve the Ottomans. Unfortunately, in the 20th century, we're going to see lots of examples of genocide. Genocide is the purposeful attempt to exterminate a group of people based on ethnicity. The big one that people think of when they think of a genocide are the Jews in World War II, and we are definitely going to cover that story later on in this class but the armenian genocide is going to be the first big genocide of the 20th century and is committed by the ottomans during world war one on a group of people in their empire called the armenians the armenians are ethnically white caucasian Christians. They were a minority part of their empire. And the Armenians had been largely peaceful, happy, successful members of the Ottoman Empire for hundreds and hundreds of years. Well, as other white Christian groups break away from the Ottomans, the Ottomans had become increasingly more distrustful of the Armenians. And you have some radical Ottoman leaders who were very, very, very nationalists who are pushing this agenda of their ethnic superiority. And during the war, the Ottomans are going to attempt a genocide on this group of people in their own empire who they didn't think they could trust. It's very, very similar to what Hitler's going to do 20 years later, or 30 years later where they just round up pockets of Armenians, ship them to refugee camps, and very frequently just cold-bloodedly murder them. Men, women, children. A conservative estimate of how many Armenians are killed in this genocide is 800,000 people. I've seen numbers as high as 2 million. Now, the West didn't honestly, truly didn't know that this was going on during the war. Information wasn't passed on as easily and as readily as it is today. And this was deep in the Ottoman Empire. However, after World War I, it becomes very clear what had happened. And one of the things that's important to know is the Ottomans and the leaders of this empire who commit this genocide are never held to be accountable for their actions. 
None of the members are tried for war crimes. There's no punishment for this. This is going to inspire an entire later generation of genociders. Hitler later on is going to say, of course I can kill. He's, he actually says this. We can exterminate the Jews because who did anything to stop the Ottomans with the Armenians? Like that's an actual, I'm paraphrasing an actual quote of his, where this is going to inspire dictators down the road to commit acts of genocide because they feel like they're not going to be held accountable for their actions. And this is one of the first, and unfortunately, of several instances of genocide that's going to happen all throughout the 20th century. And it's associated with World War I, not World War II. Now, as the Ottoman Empire is falling apart and is collapsing, a Turkish nationalist is going to pick up the pieces of the empire and he's going to build a nation state. His name is Mustafa Kumal, but his, he's frequently known as Ataturk, which is a title that he takes for himself. Now, Ataturk's a really, really, really interesting guy. He was a leader in the Ottoman um, military during World War I, but he's also a nationalist, and he does believe in liberal ideals. I could spend days talking about Ataturk. I think Ataturk might be the most underappreciated leader in the history of the 20th century. He takes an empire that's falling apart and he builds a nation state. He is the father of the modern day nation state of Turkey. And here's the interesting thing about Ataturk. Ataturk fundamentally was a liberal. He wanted to see an enlightenment based form of government with rights and privileges. He wanted his society, or at least the government of his society, to be secular and not following Muslim laws. He wanted to modernize his state. But in the aftermath of all of the mess that had happened in the Ottoman Empire in World War I, when he seizes power, he's initially going to rule as a dictator. Complete and total power is in his hands. But that's not what he wants the ultimate goal of the Ottoman Empire, of Turkey, his new nation state, to be. But he believes in the beginning, Turkey needs a firm hand, and he's that firm hand. And for example, early on in his reign, there's a communist movement, movement in Turkey. He's like, no, we're not even playing with this. Rounds up all the communist leaders that he can and executes them. But as time phases in, as more stability and more time has gone, Ataturk phases in a Western style liberal democracy into Turkey. He starts on the lowest levels of society. He allows for local elections and then he allows increased freedom of the press. One of the things he emphasizes is in his new state, there's going to, the government's going to have a secular legal code. In America, we have separation of church and state. In Turkey, they have separation of Islam and state, mosque and state. And he's phasing in liberal democracy. Ten years into his reign, he famously asks one of his friends to create an opposition party to him so that people can get multiple perspectives on what could be best for this new state while all the time keeping all the power. And what Ataturk is during, do, doing during his long time as leader is he's teaching a group of people, Muslims, Muslim Turks, this is what a democracy looks like. This is how you act in a democracy. These, this is the goals. This is the ideals. One of the things he does that's very unique as a leader of a Muslim state is he promotes education for both boys and girls. And he also gives women the right to vote. So this is all quite extraordinarily because, again, it happens in a Muslim state. By the time he dies, he had created a liberal constitution and there had been enough time and phased in democracy that upon his death, instead of some other strong man coming to power, this government that he had planned gets ushered in and Turkey becomes a liberal democracy. Now, 
there have been highs and lows since that. But for the most part, Turkey has been a stable, liberal democracy with lots of the same types of freedom that we have in our own country. Now, unfortunately, some things have happened in the last five to 10 years. But I said, I said there have been some ups and downs. But what he built was pretty impressive. It's the first Muslim democracy in the world. And he's pro-West. Look at how he's dressing. He's not dressing as a Muslim leader. He's dressing as a Western leader. He's trying to bring Western culture to his people for whatever good and bad that is. Um, so he successfully picks up the pieces of the broken Ottoman Empire. And one of the outcomes for the, of the World War for the Ottomans is the creation of the new nation state of Turkey, which instead of it being an, it's an empire that ruled many, many different groups, now you have a smaller state of the Turkish people in this region. Now, let's get to the big one. Okay, we're going to have a whole day on Russia. Um, I think it's the next class period. It might be two class periods from now. Uh, Russia before World War I, like the Ottomans, were inc increasingly, to use an important historical term, deep doo-doo. Their industrialization attempts weren't necessarily paying off greatly. And when you had increased radicalization amongst the Russian people in a budding, spreading Bolshevik communist movement because there's no freedoms for the people. The king, the czar of the Russians, is still ruling with an iron grip. And while he's promoting industrialization, he's not, promise, he's not promising any of the liberal ideals of Western democracies that were industrialized promote. And there's increasingly, the people are becoming increasingly hostile to their monarch. The last thing Russia needed in 1914 was to join World War I. Remember, they're one of the main protagonists for why World War I happens. Well, the war goes very, very, very poorly for Russia. By 1917, their lines had been broken by the Germans and huge casualties. Remember, I told you this a few lessons ago. The country that loses the most soldiers in World War I is Russia. The country that ultimately is going to lose the most land in World War I is Russia, even though they're on the side that ultimately won. In February 1917, with the war going extremely poorly, the Tsar of Russia, Nicholas II, steps down. Now, he is he is replaced by a liberal provisional government, a government of the elites, the upper class and middle class, the educated, who had a long dream of creating a liberal style of government in Russia. The most important decision this provisional government needs to do, make is, are they going to continue fighting the war or not? And they make the decision to do so. They want to end the war, get through the war, hopefully be victorious, and then pick up the pieces and create a liberal democracy in Russia. Unfortunately, the war doesn't go any better in the summer of 1917 under the provisional government's leadership than it did under the czar's leadership. And increasingly now, the antagonism is against this government where the soldiers are done, there's food shortages, and there's extremists, the Bolsheviks, saying we have a better way. Now, before World War I, one of the main leaders of the Bolshevik movement in Russia was a leader named Vladimir Lenin. Vladimir Lenin had to go into exile before World War I, or else he was going to be captured and executed in Russia. It's a long story. It's kind of a cool story, but I'm not going to spend lots of time with it. He was sitting in a cafe in Switzerland in 1917 when some German spies came to him and said, hey, would you like to go back to Russia? The Germans know that the Russians are on the brink of collapse, and they're hoping by sneaking Lenin back into Russia. He'll start a communist revolution that will cause the collapse of the Russians and them to surrender and end the war. Well, it's a long story. It's kind of straight out of a James Bond novel, but these spies sneak Lenin in. And during the summer of 1917, as there's increasing antagonism to the provisional government, all of a sudden Lenin shows up in Russia and the Bolsheviks flock to him. And 
the Bolshevik movement is gaining more and more and more and more support. And in October of 1917, they launched a revolution. And many people wrongfully think this revolution was against the Tsar. The Tsar is out of power now. It's against the provisional government and with the backing of a large amount of the Russian people. The Bolsheviks, who are Russian communists, seize power. And they do exactly what the Germans had hoped. They surrender. They give up. They see, see huge amounts of territory. Lenin's like, okay, this war has to end so I can create a communist utopia, which is what his lifelong dream had been. It's, so it's the communists who surrender. Remember when I told you later on that the that the Allies were going to be so angry at the Russians for surrendering. It wasn't the Tsar who surrendered. It was the communists. And this is why they didn't want to give them anything at the Paris Peace Conference when the war over. There was inc incredible bitterness at the communists for doing this. Do not ever forget the Russians lose the most soldiers. The Russians lose the most people. The Russians lose the most land in World War One. This was a society that had been torn apart. But things are going to get from bad to worse. After the Russians, after the Bolsheviks seize power and World War I ends, Russia is immediately going to go into an even worse conflict for them called the Russian Civil War, which is going to happen from 1917 to 1920. In the, 19, in the Russian Civil War, they're going to, um, it's going to be a fight to the death between Bolsheviks and a really odd mixture of liberals and royalists who are going to join together, who are both desperate to stop the spread of communism. We call supporters of the Bolsheviks the Reds and their enemies the Whites. 20 million people die, many times cold-blooded murder. Both, at, both sides commit human rights violations on their populations. And this is just entirely within Russia itself. So look, think about this. You have seven to 10 million Russians die in World War One. Now we're jumping to the worst civil war of the 20th century. It's a disaster. One of the things that the Bolsheviks do is they're gonna round up the royal family who is still living in Russia and they're gonna execute them. Um, they're gonna try to wipe out the royal line of the, Rus of the Romanovs the Romanovs being the family that had, the Tsars had come from, and they're going to ex execute Nicholas II. This is why a lot of people think that the Russian Revolution was against the Tsar, but it wasn't. Who wins? The Reds, which means Lenin is going to be the first successful communist revolutionary in world history. And he's going to create the first major communist state, the state of Russia. And now we're going to get to finally see if the ideals of the Russians of communism can actually work. You have a society that is completely broken by this point. The, the terrors of World War I and the Civil War. And the question is going to be, can Lenin and Bolshevik revolutionaries successfully pick up the pieces and create a communist utopia. And does communism actually work or not? Unfortunately for Lenin, he's going to die very soon after the Civil War. He doesn't get to actually implement many of the ideas of communism which means that that's going to be left to his successor. So Lenin is the revolutionary, and the successor who's going to come behind him is going to be the one who's ultimately going to try to implement the ideas of the Bolsheviks. Unfortunately, if you know anything about world history, Lenin's successor is going to be a madman named Joseph Stalin. And things in Russia are about to jump from bad to much, much worse. But that is a story for another day. Y'all have a great day today.